Hello, welcome to lecture 8, where we're going to go a little bit deeper on Natraverso, because this is an important aspect of IPOP, and important for you to understand how it works and how to configure. So Natraverso is necessary because IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, are running short uh, in the internet. Uh, essentially, there's 32 bits used to name an IPv4 uh, endpoint, so that gives you about 4 billion numbers if you used all of them and some of them are not available to use because of um, fragmentation and with the increasing number of devices connected to the internet uh, it's not possible to name all of them with a unique IP address. So one approach uh, to sidestep this problem before uh, I, the version 6 of the IP protocol is available is to use network address translators. So a NAT essentially takes multiple endpoints and map them to a single IP address. Uh, in uh, the, net, um, the NAT's public-facing site. Typically it works well if you have clients behind the NATs, but once you have servers, it makes it complicated because servers need to be accessible with a well-known IP address um, to, be, uh, to receive new messages. So for instance, if you have a host here, A, with this IP address, uh, it's a private IP address uh, when you're a host that's behind a NAT. The NAT itself will have a private address on this side and a public address on this side. So when this host sends a packet to a public uh, machine, that packet gets to be translated by the NAT. Uh, and the, the source of the packet becomes now the public address of the NAT with some port that the uh, NAT allocates for this. And so the destination can reach uh, the device back because the destination comes with the address of the uh, NAT and with the port that the NAT used, and then the NAT maps and translates uh, the packet back uh, once it's sent to the host inside uh, the private network. So the trick here is that the NAT has to create these dynamic mappings and has to keep them somewhere in memory so that it remembers where to send a reply when it comes back. Now this public node could be a stun server and what the stun server does that's interesting is it tells uh, the host by sending inside the payload of the message what address it came from. So A can discover that its address on the edge of the net is 128.27.56.83 with this port by asking the public host, uh, the stun server, to tell it uh, to reflect uh, back to it what, uh, what address it saw a packet coming from. So typically from uh, NATs that are well behaved so to speak, uh, knowing that information is enough to create a P2P uh, UDP uh, link using uh, hole punching techniques. If NATs are of the symmetric type we're going to have to use a third party on the public network to relay messages. So how does it work, uh, the whole punching process, in a little bit more detail? So let's say we have here Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob contact the stun server. It doesn't have to be the same, but Alice asks the stun server, what's my endpoint? That message goes through its uh, NAT, so Alice's NAT. And Bob does the same thing, asks what is my endpoint to the stun service. Now those... Uh, endpoints will tell Alice that its uh, NAT mapped address is IP address M and port X and for Bob IP address N and port Y. So Alice and Bob learn that information by talking to stun service. Now they're going to use the XMPP server, the online social network a server, to tell each other these endpoints. So Alice will tell um, Bob that she wants to connect and will send Bob this endpoint, which is the address at the edge of the net. Bob will use this service uh, in the same way to tell Alice that he wants to connect using this port NY. So these are ports on the physical network. Remember, this is the net on the physical network at the edge of the uh, connection uh, between Alice and Bob to the internet. So now Alice and Bob will try to create uh, holes in, in the net, so to speak. And this is 
performed by Alice sending a packet to the destination that he learned uh, for B, which is NY in this example. So the packet comes this way from source Alex, uh, uh, Alice with a private address. It goes through the net, so it translates uh, to have source uh, MX in the net with a destination NY. The same thing happens on the other path. Bob sends a message with itself as a source with the destination that he learned from the XMPP uh, message. And that translates by the net and goes this way to Alice's net. So for call nets, these translations will work out in a way that perhaps the first packet will be dropped by both nets because they never saw a packet coming from Alice or Bob. But eventually, because Alice sends a packet to Bob and Bob sends a packet to Alice, there's going to be a mapping established here for Alice and Bob in, in the respective nets that will allow the second packet to, uh, to punch through. And once these packets start to flow, the net uh, communication will be um, uh, communication between Alice and Bob in a P2P fashion will be possible and tunneling starts to be uh, possible between these two peers and then a chain can link is established and communication can flow directly between Alice and Bob without going through the turn server, without going through the stun server, without going through an XMPP server. It's really just between these two endpoints. Now this works uh, many times, but sometimes it fails. Uh, it works uh, for uh, cone nets, for nets that essentially reuse the same mapping uh, when talking to a different peer. So, in fact, this works for restricted and port-restricted cone nets. But symmetric nets, we use a different mapping uh, for the stun server and for the other endpoint. And this approach does not work. You have to predict a port in order to try to make it work. Port prediction is difficult. So instead, we use uh, relays uh, with a turn service. The idea will be the relay will serve as a point that's accessible by both Alice and Bob on the public network. And the tin can link will look the same way once it's established, except it's going to be slower because it's going to communicate through a third party. But it's going to be abstracted in the same way as the P2P um, uh, stun net traversal link. Again, traffic will not go through the stun server. Traffic will not go through the XMPP server. In this case, we'll go through the relay server and back uh, to the destination. So how is this configured in IPOP? This is specified in a configuration file. The configuration file that can name all the stun servers you may want to use. And IPOP will pick one at random uh, to communicate with. And that helps with load balancing. There are several free stun servers you can use, or you can use your own if you'd like. Uh, for turn, you also configure the list of turn service, uh, services you want to use. Free turn servers are harder to come by because they, they relay traffic. They don't just, uh, they're don't just they not as lightweight as a stun server. But you can run your own turn services. There are uh, open source implementations of turn servers. And if you use eJabberD as an XMPP server, it actually doubles as a stun server if you'd like to use that as well. And there are tutorials on our website that show you how to deploy your own XMPP server, your own stun server, or your own turn server as well. So you're free to choose and configure in the IPOP configuration file how you're going to handle net traversal. So here's a peek at uh, how you would provide this information to IPOP. Uh, first of all, the XMPP server and the username and password for the XMPP server you want to use, a list of endpoints for the stun servers that you want to use. That's the IP address and the port, and also a list of endpoints for the turn servers you want to use. Our turn servers also will require username and password to authenticate. That's all uh, possible through the configuration file, and you're free to choose which XMPP service you want to use to communicate with your friends, which net traversal services you want to use as well.